A man named Jack was walking along a steep cliff one day when he accidentally got too close to the edge and fell. On the way down, he grabbed a branch, which temporarily stopped his fall. He looked down into his horror, horror, saw that the canyon fell straight down for more than a thousand feet. He couldn't hang on to the branch forever, and there was no way for him to climb up the steep wall to the cliff, of the cliff. So Jack began yelling for help, hoping that somebody passing by would hear him and lower a rope or something. Help! Help! Is anyone up there? Help! He yelled for what seemed like hours, but no one heard him. And he was about to give up when he heard a voice. Jack? Jack, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. I'm down here. I can see you, Jack. Are you all right? Yes, but who are you and where are you? I'm the Lord, Jack. I'm everywhere. You, The Lord? You mean God? That's me. God, please help me. I promise if... If you'll get me down from here, I'll stop sinning. I'll be a really good person. I'll serve you for the rest of my life. How, does that sound familiar? <laughs> Easy on the promises, Jack. Let's just get the, you down from there and we can talk. Now, here's what I want you to do. Listen carefully. Okay. I'll do anything, Lord. Just, just tell me what to do. Okay. Let go. Let go of the breath. What? I said, let go of the branch. Trust me. Let go. There was a long silence. Finally, Jack yelled, Help! Help! Is there anyone else up there? (laughs) Sometimes God wants us to do things that don't make sense. Sometimes God asks us to do things and to trust him There's almost no reason to trust him. Saying you believe means doing the works of belief. It's kind of like that story of Blondini and the wheelbarrow across the the, uh, Grand, the Niagara Falls is what it was, Niagara Falls. Grand Canyon is a good one too. (laughs) Do you get in the wheelbarrow? Saying you believe that they'll do something and taking action on it are very different things. Faith without works is a lie. Faith that doesn't result in what you do about it is simply making statements that you don't really mean. James says, clearly, faith without works is dead. Dead meaning having no life, no ability to change or grow. It is dead. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. For by grace you are saved through faith. And what did the rest of that, the next verse say? We are saved unto, to produce, for the purpose of producing good works, verse 10. If the first part is true, we have been saved by grace through faith then the second part must also be true. There must be a change in what we do. And if you don't see the results of the change of what has happened, you have to go back and question whether it really happened. Right? Now, does that mean we'll all perfectly do everything we're supposed to do? No. How many of you are sinners? saved by grace. Of course. And guess what? We will continue to sin and we will continue to deal with that until the Lord takes us home or he comes back for the church. And it will not be until that point when we have complete victory over sin. But that doesn't mean we can't have victories over sin. Right? 
plural, victories, because it's going to continue to happen and we're going to continue to have to overcome. James chapter 2 in your Bibles, verse 14, is where we will be starting. <coughs> what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can his faith save him? I want to read, just go ahead, if follow along with me. We'll put the verses up here as we preach, but I want to read the whole passage so it kind of all fits together in your mind. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good does it do? In the same way, faith, if it doesn't have works, is dead by itself. If someone will say, you have faith and I have works, show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith, I will show you faith from my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. Foolish man. If you are willing to, are, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was also active together with his works and by works faith was perfected or completed. So scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him or credited to him for righteousness for he was called God's friend. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by her works when she received the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. He starts by posing a question, what good is it? Question of usefulness. What good is it? The question is rhetorical. It assumes that the answer is no good at all. It is not asking an, for, for an answer that is different than that. It is assuming that what good is it if someone has faith but does not have works? It is no good, he is saying. The man is pre maintaining his faith. He says he has faith. It is in the present tense, meaning it's a repeated action. He says it now. He says it in the future. He continues to maintain that I'm a person of faith. I believe in, I've heard this so many times, I believe in God. I am so tired of hearing people say, I believe in God, but they don't do the works of belief because they don't have never placed faith in Jesus Christ. The demons believe that God exists. Believing in God is not the answer. Amen? Amen? And it, you should challenge anyone that says that. But do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again? And if so, what are you doing about it? He repeats his claim despite the evidence of the contrary. He does not have works. That's also in the present tense, a continual lack of works, something that, has, that starts and continues into the future. He doesn't have works now. He will not continue to not have works. He has never had works. Faith, the faith, indicating that this is saving faith. I have saving faith. Well, he gives some examples of what dead faith is, what it looks like. First of all, he talks about somebody in need, a brother or a sister. Here's somebody in the family, a fellow believer. Believe, remember that James is writing to people in the church, in the diaspora that claim to be Christians. Okay, he's treating them as brothers and sisters and he's saying you have somebody in need within the church and this is not a new need. This is a pre-existing condition. 
This is a condition they have been in for a while and they continue to be in. There is somebody that is lacking clothing and daily food. And they're found in that condition without the proper clothing for the environment, without daily food. Not even enough food to take care of today, let alone tomorrow. I don't think there's anyone in this room that lacks daily food. I know I don't. And I think most of us have closets full of clothes, don't we? But there's people in this community. There's people around the world that struggle for what they're going to eat today, that barely have enough clothing to meet their needs or have none. So what's the response? The response is good works. Go in peace. Keep warm. Eat well. I, I, hope God, I, I wish God's very best for you. Good words. But I'm not going to do one thing about it. I'm not going to provide you a morsel of food. I'm not going to start a clothing drive. I'm not going to do anything about your need. Now, needs today can be very different, right? We live in an affluent community. If you don't know that, look around. Most of us would be considered by the world's standards very affluent. We don't have brothers and sisters that are coming and sitting on the back row in desperate need of daily food or clothing. But do we have brothers and sisters that have needs? Daily needs? Spiritual, emotional needs? Or other needs that we're wishing them the best on and not doing anything about it? pronouncement of blessing is in the present passive imperative. I pray that God will bless you, continue to bless you as if he's, as if there's already blessing happening, but no actions, but you don't give them what they need. You don't do anything about it. Well, the logical conclusion about that kind of faith is that it is inconsistent with their actions and if it's inconsistent with their actions therefore that kind of faith must not be real faith it's dead it has no power well james anticipates an argument he he goes on here in verse 18 but some of you will say I know, I know, I know. Some of you are going to say, you have faith and I have works. Uh, I, can, I, can, I have faith without works. You know, I, I believe God, but I don't have to do... I'm talking to somebody this week. What a wonderful opportunity I had. I won't tell you who it was. Nobody in this room. <laughs> Says, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian, but we don't go to church and we don't... But we just pray at home and we just... It, it, what, what do you say about that? And I began, to, I began with what we believe about the Bible. What do we believe about the Bible, by the way, my friends? We value the Bible because it is True. sufficient and the supreme authority in our lives, right? And who, wrote, who gave us the Bible? It was inspired by... That doesn't mean it was inspirational. The word inspired means to exhale, to breathe out. It was breathed out, every word, every jot, every tittle, every stroke, every little thing, exactly as he wanted. And therefore, if the Bible says it, it's true. There's a bumper sticker a long time ago when bumper stickers were popular. The Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. You know what? I don't care for that middle phrase. The Bible says it, that settles it. I don't care whether you believe it or not because the Bible is God's word and he said it. Therefore, it is settled in history and 
in truth. Amen? So then I took him to Hebrews 11. Forsake not, Hebrews 10. Forsake not the assembling of yourself together. I said, the Bible says that's wrong. You should be in with other believers. There's the pur- I talked about the purpose of the church and so forth. Opportunities. Why? Because faith should result in something. Faith should be being worked out. True faith comes out in actions. Someone, one, one of these believers he's talking to that, that's getting offended because there's, James is stepping on their toes, he, he assumes he's going to ask, a person can have faith without works, but James says, show me. What, what's the show me state, Missouri? Maybe James was from Missouri. Show me, put on display your faith without your works, and I will exhibit my faith by my works. You cannot show your faith without actions. It is only words. It's only words. Well, he gives some illustrations. First of all, he gives an illustration from the Shema. The Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. It says, You believe that God is one. Verses 19 and 20. You believe that. You say that. God is one. Well, you do well. Amen. He's one. What does one mean? Unity. Our God is a triunity. Amen. God is one. The demons believe that too. And their resulting actions is fear. You see it? The demons believe and they have resulting actions. You believe say you believe and do nothing about it and you certainly don't fear God because you're not doing anything from that fear. Does fear, is fear a motivational factor in life? It's for me. I was uh, on a ride along Thursday and we got a call of a guy with a gun wanting to kill anybody that come close to him and and, uh, he was going to kill the cops and he wanted the cops to kill him. And we staged a couple blocks away and we had 14 cop cars and the mobile command center and the bearcat and the SWAT van and and uh, several detectives and a lieutenant two lieutenants and a captain and I mean I think everybody from the Tracy Police Department was out on this call and you know where I was two blocks away and I stayed there why because I didn't want to go anywhere close to that guy because I had healthy fear now praise God for these guys out of fear take protection, but they go in anyway, right? We need the first responders. Fear causes you to do some things. You better not be dumb. (laughs) Fear. Foolish man, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? James is not saying that salvation is by works. James is saying salvation results in works. Just like Paul said in Ephesians 2. But we have to look and say, look at my own life and say, where is my works? What am I doing? Why am, what am I different? Because I say, I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and was buried and rose again. What has changed in me in my actions? The Old Testament illustrations go from the demons to Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Jameson Fawcett says this, the question here is not as to the grounds on which believers are justified, but about the demonstration of their faith. So in the case of Abraham, in Genesis 22, 1, it is written, God did not tempt Abraham, that is, put put to the test of demonstration the reality of his faith, not for the satisfaction of God, who already knew it, but for the demonstration, but to demonstrate it before men. The offering of Isaac at that time, quoted here in James 2.21, formed a part, formed no part of the grounds of his justification, for he was justified previously on his simple believing in the promise of spiritual errors, that is, believers as numerous as the stars. He was then justified, and that justification was shown or manifested by his offering Isaac 40 years after. 
That work of faith demonstrated but did not contribute to his justification. The tree shows its life by its fruits, but it was alive before either fruits or even leaves appeared. Right? We are justified by faith. But he says here, was not Abraham justified or his justification demonstrated by his works when he offered a, his son Isaac on the altar? And he goes on to quote the early, the 40 years, 20 years earlier, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. But because of that belief, because of that faith, what did he do? Well, I want to I want to take you through a couple of things. Some some um, terminology. You ready, class? Okay. Romans eight thirty three. Who can bring an accusation against God? It's elect. God's elect. God is the one who justified. We are justified judicially, or like a judge, by God. God declares us not not guilty. He declares us innocent. <sighs> Judicially, meritoriously, by Christ, through the merits of, by the merits of, okay? My righteous servant will justify many. He will carry their iniquities. Meritoriously, one deserving reward or praise. He is the one that did the work. Ready for the next one? Mediately, as a mediator, or by the intervention of an intermediary, by faith. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5.1. We're good? Okay, I don't want to go too fast, though, for, for Joyce either, right? Amen? Okay, there's another one. Ready? We are declared, we are righteous evidentially by the evidence of, we're justified evidentially by our works, James 2, which is where we're at. Just, just judiciously by God, meritoriously by Christ, mediately by faith through the medium of, through the mediator, okay? Evidentially by works. Justification then must be evidenced by works. Abraham showed his works in leaving Ur of the Chaldees, Genesis chapter 12, one through four, in believing the promise of a great nation, Genesis 22, one, from, one through 14. Uh, I'm sorry, Gen, uh, Genesis uh, 15, five and six. And through the ultimate test of sacrificing his son. And if you know the story of Abraham and Isaac, you'll know that Isaac asked, da Daddy, uh, where's the lamb? And what was Abraham's answer? God will provide. And Hebrew says that Abraham understood that even if he had killed Isaac, God was able to raise him again to fulfill the promise. Remember, God didn't just say, I'm going to make you a great nation. He says, it's going to be through that boy. Right? Therefore, that boy had to live long enough to have children. He hadn't yet. Abraham believed that, took him on to the altar and prepared to kill him and was beginning to bring the knife down when the angel said, stop. You've shown your faith. You've shown your faith. And there's a ram caught in the thicket. Sacrifice him in his place, which is a picture of Jesus Christ for us, isn't it? Isn't that wonderful? Abraham took the actions of belief that God had told him directly and he believed God. You know what? You say, well, God hasn't told me anything directly. Yes, he has. 
What did we just say about the scripture? Everything in it is God talking to you directly. He wrote that to you, to me, to us. He goes on. Another illustration from the Old Testament is Ahab was not the same way Rahab, the prostitute, also justified by her works. When she received the messengers and sent them out by another way, she took action, risking her own life because she believed the God, the Jews, with what little she had, and she didn't have much. But that faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed can move mountains, that's by taking action on what we know. He compares it to the body. It says faith, just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. I've been dealing with an awful lot of death in the last two weeks. Hearing <coughs> multiple people I know going to be with the Lord. And I'm, I think that's probably going to accelerate the older I get. It's normal. Their spirit, the Bible says, absent from the body for those that believe present with the Lord. And their body is dead. Can the body without the spirit do any work? No. So faith has to have the works to be demonstrating that it is true. Well, if all that is true, maybe we should remind ourselves what are the works we should be doing. James doesn't do that here, but I'm going to give you a few. Matthew 28. What's the command in Matthew 28? Everybody should know it. What's the command? It's not go. Go is a preposition. Going. What is the verb, the, the imperative? So, somebody give it to me. Make disciples. Make disciples. Guess what we should be doing? What are the works we should be accomplishing? Commit to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Making disciples. Seeing people saved and discipling them to maturity. We are to be living witnesses. Acts 1.8. You will be. By the way, that's not a command. It is a... Uh, it's in the indicative mood, which is the statement of fact. So, do the works you do display Christ or not? Because you are a witness, you claim the name of Christ, therefore people will see you and say, that's what a Christian is like, what do they see? Jesus said, um, from 1 John chapter 2. And for some reason, I didn't put this one up there. Um, my, my mistake, but let me just read it. 1 John 2, 3. This is how we are sure that we have come to know him by keeping his commands. How do you know what he commanded? You got to kind of know the Bible, right? Which means we better be learning the Bible. But is it enough to just learn the Bible and say, I know it? This is, how, this is how we have come to know him, to be sure we have come to know him by keeping his commands. You learn and you do. You learn and you do, right? Amen? Yeah. First John 2.10, the one who loves his brother remains in the light. By loving each other. By the way, our church is good at that but is there room for improvement? Always. Always. 1 John 3, 7, Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. By living a righteous life, 
We can claim Christian liberty on a lot of things. I'm getting a little tired of hearing Christians claim Christian Christian liberty on things that probably shouldn't be claiming Christian liberty. We need to be righteous and we better be sure we're being righteous. Now we don't need to not add a bunch of rules. We don't need to be legalists, but we need to be righteous. Jesus said that's about where our heart is, isn't it? Not just our actions, but actions will follow the heart. We need to be righteous. And probably the big one, and this was our, our theme a couple of years ago, We actually kept this theme for two years, and that's love God, love people. From Matthew 22, from Luke. How do we love God? It's been a while since I asked you this question. What is the definition of love? And since we have enough new people here, I'm going to give it to you, and you need to learn it. Because I will expect you to know it. Love is doing what is best for the one loved. Love is action. Love is doing what is best for the one loved. So if we're to love God, we have to do what is best for him, not me. If we're to love each other, we're to do what is best for them, not me. Right? Where does that put you? Last? Joy Club, we did for years and years and years. I loved the acronym, put Jesus first, others are next and yourself is last. Our world teaches us that you're to be first, amen? That's what the world says. Do what's best for you. Follow your feelings. By the way, that's the worst advice anybody could ever give you. Follow your heart. Yeah, follow the thing that's wicked and evil, the Bible says. That's a good idea. (laughs) Right? Do we believe the Bible? Do we take actions on it? Love others by doing what's best for them, by putting them before my, yourself. So often, so many things come before God. What comes before God in your life? Does work sometimes come before God? It can. D- does the desire and the push to succeed and, and, and make money come before putting God first? Yeah. Does pleasure come before God? I, I, you know, I, I, I want to take a month vacation. <laughs> they were in church, folks. Nothing wrong with a vacation. But how does that align with what by putting God first. Does, does your children come before God? Does your spouse come before God? It shouldn't. God should be number one priority. The next priority in your life should be your spouse. And the third priority in your life should be your kids. They're third, not first. Is that true for you? I see so many people. My kids are my world. You know what? Make Jesus your world and your kids will be happy. Trust me. Amen? Oh, come on. Amen? Amen. Yeah. What comes between you and God? What comes between you and serving other people? Well, you know, I want to be happy, so I need to do, I I need to, uh, I'm going to pick on Braulio. I need to watch the ball game. I like ball games too, Braulio. Maybe we can use ball games to serve other people, right? But is that our mindset? Is that where we think? How is our actions living out our faith? Because if we don't have the actions of faith, we don't have real faith. Do we need to evaluate that? Absolutely, or James wouldn't have wrote it. And God wouldn't have put it in his Bible. Amen? We need to be thinking about what are the actions I should be doing. Now, I I say all this without personal criticism to anyone. I don't know how you answer those questions in your life. You have to answer that. And you know what? I stand ready for you to come and say, Pastor, I need to work on this area. Can you help me? Yeah, I'd love to. 
Guess what? There's times when I go to people that are mentors in my life and say, hey, I need to work on some areas in my life. Will you help me? That's the committing to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's a chain of discipleship. I'm being discipled while I'm discipling. Amen? Amen. What are you doing about it? God desires for you to fulfill the purpose in which he saved you, and that is to take the actions of good works in your life every day as you exercise, live out your faith. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you love us and that you give us the opportunity to love you back and that in doing that, we can love each other. Help us to be faithful. Help us to live out what you've taught us. In Jesus' name.